Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Emanuela Sirturi will defend the academic thesis, Let There Be Light, the evolution in that technology and dynamics of entry into the LED lighting market. May I invite you to present the summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Thank you. Highly esteemed professors and members of the assessment committee, family, friends, and colleagues, thanks for joining me today here in presence or uh, online. I'm here to present my research about the evolution in LED technology and dynamics of entry into the LED lighting market. My research builds on the body of literature about the role of the technology uh, in the economy, and uh, uh, it tries to provide new evidence about uh, the relationship between technological change and uh, emergence of new markets. As the title suggests, it does so by looking at a specific technology, the LED uh, technology, light emitting diode, and its use in a specific industry, the LED lighting industry. But why LED? Because LED had a disruptive impact on the lighting system and market. Today, it's the most diffuse lighting option available, having replaced uh, incandescent and fluorescent lamps. It's, but it's also interesting because it has a long uh, historical evolution that started in the 60s. At that time, LED was much less powerful and available only in red color. Over the years, it found applications in several other markets, from uh, calculators to digital watches, traffic lights, interior vehicle lighting, uh, displays, and many others. This process allowed the technology to improve uh, in its lighting efficiency, in power, in uh, uh, reducing production costs, until the invention in the 90s of uh, white color LED light. So the research question that I want to address is the following one. What has been the evolution of LED technology and how have investments in technology over time affected eventually the patterns of entry of firms in, into the lighting industry? This research question is translated into a conceptual framework that keeps together the two pieces of my research, the study of technology dynamic on the one hand and the study of market dynamics on the other. First, since LED is multipurpose, I wanted to identify the different technology domains around which the technology evolved and understand how uh, the trajectory uh, developed over time. Then I put the focus on firms and I look at the uh, intra-firm decision-making processes that can explain their uh, probability to enter the LED lighting market. I study if and how the probability of market entry is influenced by previous investments in uh, the technology and by other firms' characteristics and resources. Let me now briefly summarize the main findings of the three central chapters of my thesis. In chapter three, I analyzed the technology codes associated with over 400,000 patents in LED. This chapter shows how community detection uh, algorithms can be used to classify a large da a patent data set in a completely automated and su unsupervised way. Um, it doesn't require particularly sophisticated or advanced data science skills to be used, and it allows the flexibility of uh, choosing the level of granularity in the classification by adjusting the resolution parameters in the algorithms. Um, as you see in this chart, for instance, with, um, where I showed application of the Leiden method for the classification of technology codes, uh, at resolution if equal to two, for instance, the LED technology can be classified into 12 domains, including lighting devices, but also vehicles, electrical components, semiconductors, medical devices, displays, and, and others. Since there is an increasing demand for efficient methods to classify and find meaningful uh, technology domains that can inform the study of technologies, I believe that the methodology uh, applied in this chapter can be of interest to other technologies, especially other multipurpose and general purpose technologies that evolved across different domains, not all of which may be known ex ante. In chapter four, I build on the results of, of the previous chapter and I analyze the uh, patent citation network. 
um, this was aimed to identify and understand uh, how the uh, technology evolved, both over time and across those different domains. First, I trace the um, main technological trajectory of each uh, technology domain, and then I constructed a network of main paths um, that allowed me to, see, but to better see, to better analyze the interlinkages between all these domains over time. I found, for instance, that certain technological domains like in semiconductor, electrical components, vehicle, and lighting devices were more instrumental than others in uh, um, driving the technological trajectory, while other domains instead uh, had a more limited role uh, and followed instead distinct paths that diverged away from the main trajectory. Compared to the previous literature uh, where uh, technologies were studied and mainly used uh, main path analysis to do so in order to identify the single sequence of uh, um, innovations that were um, more important in driving the technological evolution. With this methodology instead, I try to show the complexity behind technological change and to see also uh, the contribution direct on an, or indirect that was um, given also by other secondary paths within this uh, technological landscape. In chapter five, then, I uh, link technology and market dynamics. Here I analyzed a, a technology portfolio of a sample of uh, companies that participated in the technological trajectory of lead in any domain and companies that did not participate in the trajectory. And I distinguished between companies that entered the lead lighting market and companies that did not. Consistently with the literature in strategic management, I found that the probability of enter, enter the lead lighting market was higher for firms that had previously invested in the core technology that was uh, relevant for the new market. And also for companies that had already complementary assets in place in the lighting industry. Interestingly, I also found that there is a reinforcing effect between these two variables, complementary assets and availability of core technological cap capabilities. In turn, I then wonder what explained the development of these core technological capabilities. And I discovered that um, firms are more likely to develop these capabilities if they have the complementary assets in place again, if they have integrative capabilities, meaning the capabilities to reconfigure existing assets and skills uh, in a repeated manner, and if they had um, related technologies in place. However, not all related technologies are alike, and I found that only firms that have capabilities in uh, strongly related technologies to LED lighting devices were more likely to develop uh, those core technologies and eventually enter the lead lighting market. Instead, firms that uh, had invested in other lead technologies but more weakly related to lead lighting devices um, were less likely to enter the lead lighting market, probably because they pursued other um, market opportunities. And this is consistent with the fun fact that uh, technological change, technological innovation is persistent and uh, is a persistent and cumulative process over time. Finally, I um, used a system of uh, simultaneous equations to uh, take into account the interlinkages between the two strategic decisions that I'm looking at, the decision to enter the market and the technology investment decision. Um, I found, in fact, that there is a two-way relationship between these two variables. On the one hand, it's true that having invested in core technologies influenced the, uh, and determined the entry into the lead lighting market, but it's also true that it's because the commercialization prospects in the lighting market that firms uh, decided to invest in those core um, technologies. I believe that this research provides several contributions to the literature. Uh, in addition to those that I have already um, mentioned when discussing the findings of particular chapters, I would like to stress here a couple of more general conclusions and implications. Um, first, 
This research, I think, shows how interesting and innovative findings can be obtained by combining theories, concepts, and methods from different fields, from evolutionary economics, economics of innovation, strategic management. The characterization of technologies and technological capabilities, for instance, according to the contribution of the technology in the overall technological trajectory, and the distinction between uh, uh, strongly and weakly related technologies, and technologies that converge into, rather than diverse the way, uh, the technological main path, um, I believe that it allows to expand on the notion of uh, technological relatedness and how it um, affects the behavior of firms. Also, the story of LED shows that radical technolo technological change, also in a low-tech market, can uh, come through cross-sectoral linkages from other industries, from other related industries. Uh, in the case of LED, for instance, this came from the semiconductor industry. Uh, also, it shows, and this hints at the importance for firms to monitor technological change that occurs not only in their own industry, but also in other related industry and also in other segments of the value chain. The story of LED also shows that technological development can take long time, and therefore, long term and targeted investments may be needed to steer science and technology in strategic fields. With this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention, and I give the word back to the Prorector. Thank you. The um, opposition is organized as follows. We've got uh, six members who are part of the degree committee. Uh, two of them will be online. Um, one member is absent, but his questions will be dealt with by uh, the chair of the assessment uh, committee, uh, who will get the floor first. And that's Professor Dr. Cohen, who was, as I mentioned already, the chair of the assessment committee, and whose expertise is uh, at this university in economics of technical change, and at Strasbourg University at management. So the floor goes to Dr. Cohen. Thank you, Prorector. Dear candidate, let me begin on congratulating you on completing this work. It's a large piece of work covering uh, a lot of ground. Uh, you've obviously done a lot of work processing data and manipulating data and trying to figure out what it says. Um, that's a big job. And you've documented it very extensively in your thesis. So there doesn't seem to be much missing, um, which doesn't make for easy reading all the time, but it's there. So let me congratulate you on that. And um, it was a, a pleasure reading it. Um, I only know about lead lighting as a consumer, so I was interested to find out more about the technologies. But let me ask you about one of your results, <coughs> which you clarified it a little bit for me in the presentation, but let me ask anyway, because there may be more that can be said. Um, in this, in your institute, um, and indeed your, your supervisors have been instru instrumental in pushing the idea that technology is systemic. Technologies don't exist by themselves. They're all connected to all kinds of other things, technologies and social issues and so on and so forth. So in order for a firm to be successful with a technology, it needs to understand the things that the technology is connected to. At the very least, understand it and probably master it, um, if it especially for a, a young technology. So one of your results in Chapter 5 puzzled me. And the result says that having developed related technological capabilities of any kind in the three years before entry is negatively associated with entry. And it's a big, big effect. Now, this seems peculiar given that what is now essentially dogma about the systemic nature, um, which does imply that complementary assets should make it easier to enter. So we have a situation where the theory tells us things should be easier to enter, but you find that they um, aren't. It isn't easier to enter. So a strong interpretation of this is that the dogma is somehow mistaken and your supervisors have been chasing, barking up the wrong tree for many years. Supervisors and many of the rest of us. So I'd like you to think about that, but before I give the floor to you, I want to move on to a couple of sentences later where you say entry into the, uh, the lighting market is less likely for firms that focus their innovative activities on the development of etc. And I'm interested in the word focus 
because it means that's what they do to the exclusion of other stuff. And I'm wondering how you conclude that it's a focus, because your definition of complementary assets is just the number of patents in lighting outside LED. A firm could have many patents outside LED, but still be focused on LED. So those are my observations about that particular feature of your thesis, and I'd be interested to hear your reflections on it. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and question. I wouldn't dare with my research to put in question uh, dogmas or uh, um, consolidated literature in this field that in fact I consider and I believed in uh, for my research. I think that um, I tried and not always uh, that was possible to measure in uh, an empirical way how systemic technological change occurs. I tried to do that in chapter five where, where with systems of equations and with other um, econometric models that I use for also for robustness, I tried to take into account that not everything is so simply explained and it's not just that by having technology you can achieve something on the market. Um, this is something that I could only um, probably partially take into account and show with the econometric models because uh, probably uh, the, the, the systemic nature of uh, technological change is something that uh, would require also other, compl other complementary tools and other complementary methodologies to, be, to fully uh, explore, understand and proven. Uh, with my research, um, I could at least, I, I think, confirm the fact that technological change uh, it's uh, um, and the development of technological capabilities is an endogenous process that is also influenced by the behavior of firms and uh, the um, market system, the structure of a market also, not only individual actors, but also at a, at a meso level, also the structure of the market. Um, it's true that uh, um, I couldn't really find um, and I couldn't really explain how systemic technological change was and it's true that um, I understand uh, your point about the fact that I found that in general technological capabilities are negatively um, um, that, uh, in, are negatively correlated with, uh, um, with entry. In the few years, however, and I would like to stress that, in the few years before uh, the market entry itself. I explained that result in, do, in two ways. First, because in that correlation, what I was doing was to take into account any kind of uh, um, technological capabilities in LED in any possible domain. And because I find both in the technological trajectory analysis and also in this paper, in this, in this fifth chapter, that not all technological capabilities had the same role uh, in fostering market entry. Um, when I put them together and I take them as a whole in uh, finding a correlation with the market entry, I don't find a significant uh, uh, association with market entry. I find it instead when I uh, distinguish between strongly related and weakly related technologies. In that case, strongly related technologies that are developed in a few years before market entry, those are positively correlated with market uh, entry itself. And this is also from, uh, not only from the correlation test, but also from the model itself. The other point that I would like to stress is that in that correlation, I'm looking only at the few years before market entry. And it's true that I find that uh, um, the, the technological development that occur right before market entry in the right, in the strongly related technologies, uh, influenced uh, the entry decision. Uh, but it's also true that there is a long historical uh, process of learning and technological uh, and development in a cumulative manner of those capabilities that I don't just see in the, um, in the, in the patent data in the few years before, be, before the market entry, but it's in a way um, encapsulated in it. It's hidden into the fact that you were able in those years to develop those right capabilities that enable you just a few years afterwards to enter the market. So I can, um, I, I can sense, I can feel that those capabilities that I observed there are something more and that are something that capture the whole learning, a very long learning process that happened uh, in firms. And this is the way how I uh, explained those results in, uh, in, those, in, the, in the chapter. 
it's also true and they take the point that um, lead is lead and if you have uh, technological capabilities in lead why should be different to have those capabilities applied in lead lighting devices rather than in other uh, lead related technologies and applications um, so the word focus that you read in uh, in that sentence of the chapter may be uh, yeah may, may may puzzle you because of that um, I explain in fact in um, throughout the, the entire thesis that lead is not one technology it's a multi-purpose technology and I explained that there, there are different uh, I tried to explain at least that there are different capabilities different um, um, investments uh, efforts by different firms uh, to advance the technology in several different domains and these domains at a certain point diverge from each other so at a certain point you may say that lead applied for projectors projectors is not really the same as lead applied in uh, uh, residential lighting they rely on different investments in terms of uh, um, optical components, for instance, in terms of uh, um, um, heat dissipation um, um, technologies and processes that at a certain moment you would say that probably once a technological path on these fields has, has diverged away from the technological trajectory, probably we could not really consider that technology any longer belonging to the same uh, overall technology. And I think this is a specific feature that I could observe with lead precisely because it's multipurpose. And so I, can, I could observe that it's not as an homogeneous technology as I myself expected when I started looking at lead. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Nomala, who was also a member of the assessment committee and whose area of expertise is in economics of innovation at this university at UNU Merit. The floor goes to Dr. Nomala. So also my compliments for this nice piece of work and having completed it. It was a, it was a joy to read it, especially the first two chapters. So the topics that are really areas where I'm extremely interested in. So, and, but I couldn't find much there to challenge you with. So you did a great job there. So therefore, I'm going to challenge you on the fifth chapter. So the title looks fantastic. So entry into the lead market. Okay. So in lighting, and it's a technology-based market. Okay. So this sounds fine. And then as I keep on reading, I stumble upon a number of footnotes which basically indicates what kind of things were excluded from the definition of LED market. So on one of them, in I think page 164, says that we do not consider the production of or the sales of LED bulbs and chips and everything is excluded unless it's a fixture. So that is a bit of sh a bit shocking to me because whatever remains after you exclude those where the technology goes in the LED itself and or the chips that were basically a big deal in terms of the retrofitting of LEDs to the existing existing furniture and existing fixtures was a very important part of this process for the transition from normal light bulbs to LED bulbs. So what remains gives me the impression that what you are talking about in terms of the LED market is basically furniture. So I would like to ask you, why did you make this choice in terms of what you have excluded from the definition of LED? And whatever remains, so how would you convince us that this what I call a bit you know, harshly as furniture has anything to do with furnitures for, for, for uh, with sorry uh, with technology based markets? Thank you, um, esteemed opponent, for your compliments and question. Um, yes, I 
took a narrow definition of the market that I was looking at, and I consider only the um, producers of LED lighting fixtures, LED lighting devices. I excluded companies that only produced bulbs or chips without also entering themselves into the um, production of devices where those lamps and chips could be installed on. Uh, this doesn't mean that I don't have in my um, sample of companies the big players in the world in terms of uh, bulb production. We have Philips, we have Osram and Siemens, we have a number of other uh, companies that started from producing the light source itself and they also uh, sold it, sell it into the market so that other companies could just absorb the new technology and uh, use it to, uh, for retrofitting solutions. But they are there also because they also produce their own lighting devices and they actually decided to step into that lighting market, some of which were already in as incumbent firms and some of which instead decided to enter because of them. There is, for instance, also Siemens who was producing uh, and very active in the uh, LED production, but they were active in a completely different uh, field. They were only in, in this place, um, in the display market. And they decided at a certain moment also because they had the technology to step into this specific market that I was looking at. The reason why I decided to take this narrow definition is precisely because I, I was very interested in this very different market, low-tech market, consumer market, that actually was completely transformed by the, light, uh, by the, by, by the technological change in lighting. Uh, I was interested uh, also in understanding what, and this is not really explicit in my thesis, um, but I can tell you now. Um, I was interested also in see how uh, technological change coming from uh, a certain type of market, a Schumpeterian II market, if you like, uh, with very concentrated, very concentrated market where high investments are needed to produce la those kind of products, um, could interact, could uh, what kind of relations there, there could be between this market and a very completely different market with many, many firms, not high tech, uh, that were probably just waiting for years that the new lighting sources would be available for them to be able to do some uh, innovations in, in, in their own products. I think that, um, so I was interested in this aspect and this is the reason why I decided to focus only on, uh, on those companies, provided that I make sure that in that sample I had very different types of companies, including um, producers of uh, lead chips and bulbs. I, however, think that by, um, I also think that by constraining, limiting the analysis, as I did, to the incubation period of the industry, and so considering only the period between uh, 1993 when the white lead was developed until 2009 or 10, I could only focus in fact in, those, in that period on uh, companies that uh, for which technological development and having technological capabilities was mattering, was, was important in order to step into the market uh, of light, uh, lighting devices. If I, was, if, if I focused instead also or only on the following uh, period after 2010, there I agree that the, the market would be a completely different one. We would have a different process to look at, retrofitting um, solutions and retrofitting decisions by, by firms. And so the, the, the kind of uh, entry decision in the market would be also different because I would be looking at these companies instead. But I think that the narrow definition of the, market that I of the market that I took, combined with the narrow definition of the time period, made the, um, the analysis uh, coherent in itself um, and able to tell something about that specific period and companies that uh, um, had, in fact, a role in technological investment, perhaps not necessarily uh, in the production of lead, but still uh, they, 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 they had a role in developing the technologies in those period of incubation before the technology was basically feel freely, freely available to anyone afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by uh, Professor Dr. Meliziani, who is uh, uh, also a member of the assessment committee and who is a professor in applied economics at Louise Business School in Rome. The floor goes to Professor Meliziani. Thank you.
Thank you. It was really a pleasure to, to read this, uh, this work that is very rich. I uh, really want to start congratulating uh, for, for, this, for, for this work. Um, and uh, I agree on the fact that uh, uh, the first uh, chapters uh, that we are, we are only on technologies um, are really very, very solid uh, and they uh, provide a very interesting uh, uh, evidence. I will focus on uh, um, chapter five, which tries to link uh, the evolution of technologies uh, with uh, uh, the process uh, of uh, entry into the lead industry. And uh, here um, I see a little bit of, uh, uh, let's say, mm, not problems, uh, but I would like to uh, have some clarification uh, on, uh, um, let's say, the theoretical model uh, in the sense that uh, I see in particular um, in uh, uh, figure uh, 26, uh, that is uh, a, a sort of, uh, let's say, theoretical lens to use um, uh, for relating uh, complementary assets uh, and core technology capability to market entry. And that follows uh, uh, the approach um, uh, that is uh, uh, empirically um, uh, uh, used in the first part of the chapter, where basically market entry depends on complementary assets and core technology capabilities. But if you go on reading the chapter, then you find a different interpretation that I, let's say, um, I am more in line with. That is basically the coevolution uh, of uh, entry and development uh, of core technology capabilities. Uh, that then empirically uh, means that rather than uh, um, having, uh, let's say, core technology capabilities as an explanatory variable for market entry, you try to model uh, in a simultaneous, uh, um, uh, uh, using simultaneous equation. Uh, the process of entry and developing uh, of core technology capabilities. So I would like to uh, have a little bit of a clarification on, on this, uh, since um, um, these are a little bit two different ways of looking at uh, um, uh, the, the relationship uh, between uh, uh, technology and, uh, and market entry. And with respect to this question, uh, I would also uh, uh, maybe suggest uh, to, um, uh, uh, to consider the fact that uh, entry might not, be, uh, might not be the most important, the most relevant uh, um, uh, uh, choice for firms, uh, since uh, we know from, uh, from the literature, uh, from the stylized effect of, uh, of entry, that uh, um, many firms uh, tend to enter into a market uh, and then they do not survive. So, uh, probably um, the, the simultaneity between the development of core technology capabilities and being in the market is really what uh, is important for the development of, uh, of the industry over, over, the long, uh, uh, over the long run. So my question is basically, uh, you have used two different models. Uh, the first one does not to take into account the problem of self-selection. The second one does, but the second one is not really very well represented in the theoretical framework. Can you tell us something about, about this? Thank you. Highly esteemed professor, opponent. Thank you for your compliment and question, and nice to meet you. Um, The reason why, and I agree on that, um, the theoretical model presented at the beginning of the chapter doesn't fully take into account the coevolutionary process that, in fact, um, guided the definition of the variables that I entered the model and also uh, a specific model that I applied throughout the empirical, in, in the empirical section of that chapter, is that I wanted to start from a standard model in the literature of strategic management, which is the one that is uh, uh, inspiring me in uh, defining this theoretical model developed by Muin and tested by, by, by them in another field um, with all this idea of technological relatedness. So I wanted to put, to start my research by putting it firmly into this uh, particular um, stream of literature. 
and then show how this could be enriched and also, the f also in terms of findings uh, in the interpretation of findings, how this could be enriched by in uh, embracing instead a co-evolutionary pers perspective uh, in the analysis. So um, I take the point that uh, there should probably be another way to uh, probably put it in front and to, to revise, to adjust the theoretical framework in order to incorporate already there this idea of uh, co-evolution. Um, thanks for the comment, therefore, and um, since uh, we are planning to prepare to draft a cha uh, paper out of this chapter, I think this is something that we can consider when uh, redrafting the paper. Uh, on the second question, I agree, and uh, this is um, my big regret for this research, in fact. I started by, um, and I wanted to go farther. I'm not only interested um, in entry, uh, I discovered that there was a lot to uh, know about entry and to study about entry, so at the end, the chapter was about that. But the, my, my initial idea in the PhD proposal was instead to go ahead and also look at firm performance in the market. Um, and also, I know from, uh, uh, based on the interviews that I carried out with the firms that there are interesting stories to tell about uh, why certain firms, big incumbents, decided to step in uh, this market earlier than others, but then decided also to exit it when the market became too crowded and full of uh, firms just doing furniture. Um, I would have uh, uh, stories to tell about that. I would have data to use about that, uh, also in terms of performance. Um, I have uh, for these firms data on uh, um, turnover uh, in, the, in this specific market, and so I, I, I wanted at first to study also the, the change in the market in terms of concentration, in terms of, mar of firm performance uh, after the market was uh, actually um, um, born. But because there was so much to study about market entry itself, I left this for future research. But I must say that I'm very curious to see how could I could incorporate also that part of analysis in what I've done, in the data that I have, uh, because I think there will be a lot of, to learn also from there, from that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Fisantin, who is, uh, whose area of expertise is in economics and innovation at UNU Merit. The floor goes to Dr. Fisantin. Uh, thank you. So thank you, Emanuela. First of all, uh, I join uh, my colleagues uh, in congratulating for you for the great achievement. I really enjoy reading uh, your thesis, uh, and uh, I really enjoy and appreciate the fact that on one side, uh, you develop uh, a solid empirics, uh, but on the other side, uh, uh, you develop also and you build up uh, a strong the theoretical part. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, you show the depth uh, knowledge in the field, but also uh, in, uh, in, the, in your empirical setting that uh, is uh, the lead industry. Um, I have a, a question uh, also uh, in my case uh, on chapter five that uh, attracted uh, the most of our attention. Uh, in this chapter, uh, you relate uh, the technology capabilities and uh, complementarity access of a firm uh, to the probability of entering uh, a new emerging market. And uh, you consider a specific industry, the uh, lead lighting industry. Um, my question is, uh, um, um, what about uh, the generability of uh, your uh, uh, results? In particular, uh, in particular, I'm curious uh, in knowing uh, uh, your opinion about, uh, um, so do you think that your results will stay, and if yes, uh, which of uh, those results will stay in a technology, in a less complex technology? Because I think that uh, uh, the lead industry has uh, uh, some peculiarities, and uh, it, it is a technology is a very, very, is a very complex technology that uh, might have some similarity with other technology, maybe in the biotech. I don't know you. Uh, you can correct me because uh, you are the expert uh, in the lead technology. But uh, yeah, I would be curious uh, uh, in, in uh, discussing with you about the generability to other kind of industries. Thank you. Estimo Poon, and thank you for your compliments and question. Um, I think that the generability of my results 
uh, stem from the fact that I'm looking at multipurpose technology. So in principle, uh, the theoretical framework that I put in place and the um, findings that I got from the empirical results looking at a specific industry and a specific technology, I would expect could also be used for other kind of general uh, purpose or multipurpose technology. This whole idea of distinguishing between types of uh, technological domains, types of technological capabilities within an overall, uh, under an overall umbrella, umbrella of uh, the same technology, I think this uh, um, is something that um, uh, can also be interest to other uh, technologies like this one that have the these, these characteristics of being perva per pervasive technology uh, in the economy. And there are plenty of examples about that. So I wouldn't be, um, I would love to see this theoretical framework and this, a similar analysis being carried out on other, another kind of similar multipurpose technology. You also currently argued that LED, however, probably uh, is a sophisticated and complex technology, and so what with other less complex technologies? Um, I, it's an interesting question, and I'm wondering um, if we can really say what's a, what is a less complex technology. LED today, when I started my research, I really didn't think it was a complex technology. Semiconductor technology is generally recognized as being a complex general purpose and uh, um, technology worth of a lot of investigation. LED, um, it's, if you want, an application of the semiconductor technology. And today, I, I, I wouldn't know if I, def I would define it as complex technology. Still, uh, so th that makes me wonder if uh, we could also see other less complex technologies instead start studying them and then probably realize that because of the whole technological uh, uh, development that happened uh, behind the scenes to get that technology ready for use in very easy and common uh, uh, products. Um, so probably that technology, you wouldn't be able, you, you wouldn't define it uh, as less complex. Uh, because of the long historical evolution it had to bring it, and because of the different technologies that for any products are needed to, um, to, 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 to make a new technology, to make a new product. So I wouldn't, um, I, I wouldn't consider the degree of complexity of a technology as a criterion to decide whether this theoretical framework can be applied to or not. I would just try to consider technologies that we know are applied in more than one uh, field and see if uh, this theoretical framework holds and uh, what I've found, what I, the main messages of my, of my uh, re chapters would be still relevant in describing that technological evolution and uh, first behavior of, uh, uh, in, in that particular technological domain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Matthew, who is uh, also whose expertise is also in the area of economics of innovation at UNU Merit at this university. The floor goes to Dr. Matthew, uh, who is also online. Hi, um, candidate. Uh, congratulations on uh, the thesis and um, also for coming up with a cool uh, title. <laughs> Not just a title, but it's a very uh, rich uh, thesis and also a uh, novel. Um, in particular, the the role of firms on uh, technology trajectory is uh, relatively understudied, and the thesis uh, makes a good contribution in that respect. So, in your work, uh, you show the importance of uh, characterizing technologies based on uh, different degrees of uh, relatedness, uh, since they can be associated with different market entry strategies, as you argue. So more or less um, LED technology domains were identified based on the position um, in the patent citation network and the technological trajectory. So uh, my question is this, could you motivate the choice of the measure of relatedness uh, that you used? Uh, and do you think uh, your results would uh, hold, would be consistent using different measures of technological relatedness. Um, um, in the literature, there are the concepts of similarity, proximity, um, centrality, and yeah. Um, esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and question. Um, yes, the whole concept of technological relatedness and 
the way how to measure technological relatedness is key in that chapter, in chapter five of my thesis. Um, I decided to uh, use that particular definition of relatedness that takes into account the interlinkages in the patent citation network that I had observed in the previous chapter, and also the directions of uh, uh, those technological domains uh, within the technological trajectory. Um, but since this was a key variable, since, uh, was a key concept uh, for that chapter, I also tested um, the, the variable construction and the variable application in the empirical model with uh, other uh, slightly different definition that still uh, relied on the um, analysis of uh, technological uh, uh, of uh, patent citations. So I built, in fact, different uh, measures of technological uh, um, relatedness, and I compared the way how uh, the different domains of lead clustered around these uh, strongly, moderately, weakly related technologies depending on the methodologies that I, that I used. I also di used different uh, um, scales and different uh, numbers of uh, um, levels of uh, relatedness to describe it. And uh, um, it, it was not, in fact, changing a lot in terms of empirical results, and so I decided to stick to a simple definition of uh, uh, different measures to, of relatedness as the one that, that I used there. But uh, um, I, I take the point that there could be other uh, measures that go beyond just looking at the di direction of patent citations, but looks also at the centrality of uh, um, of, of the domains within the technological landscape, proximity and similarity, that's true. Um, this is something that I only briefly touch upon uh, in chapter four, when I try to, um, or, or chapter three, when I try to describe the differences between the domains that I was finding with the community detection analysis. But then uh, I decided to stick to one definition of uh, relatedness that was more directly um, uh, connected not only to the um, to measures of patent citations links, but also to the uh, visual descriptions of the technological trajectory, and so being able to describe which of those trajectory were having a, a converging rather than a diverging direction into the um, in, in, from the trajectory. So my definition of relatedness uh, is a mix, in fact, of. Uh, um, of patent-based indicators and uh, visual inspection of the technological trajectory. There could be other uh, methods to use. I trust that the result would not change significantly uh, if I had applied also those methods. Thank you. The opposition, the opposition will be continued by Dr. Simons, but who, he's absent, uh, but he sent the question to uh, Professor uh, Cohen, who will now uh, read one of his questions, uh, and we will see how uh, the candidate will respond to that. Thank you, Prorector. <coughs> um, Professor Simons asks me to extend my congratulations to you, Manuela. Um, and he uh, has, uh, extends congratulations and good wishes. Um, he sent several questions, one of which I will simply read to you now. In a 2021 paper in the American Economic Review, Braguinsky, Oyama, Okazaki, and Syverson study technological innovation and new products. They show that in Japan cotton spinning during the years 1893 to 1914, Companies with R&D projects to develop sophisticated products rarely produced the sophisticated products. However, the R&D made the companies more likely to start making some more ordinary products that they did not make before. Here's the question. Did companies with sophisticated LED-related research also benefit by making more ordinary products? Um, highly esteemed professor, thank you for your compliments and question. Um, I can make an example of uh, a firm that I interviewed, so I know the example, there may be others, that had uh, invested a lot of time and resources in developing um, lead in a much more sophisticated fields, and then they just decided to um, enter the lighting market by producing um, lighting devices or lamps themselves. Um, it's Osram, 
they had um, in the 80s they had invested significantly in uh, applying the LED technology in the uh, vehicle lighting system. And that is, I would say, a very sophisticated field because it combines uh, um, the use of LED with um, certain um, optical elements and uh, um, diffusing elements and also sensors elements that found the application in the car uh, market, um, which is a very concentrated market and in which they invested a lot. So there was a real a lot of investment behind this, uh, the development of this technology, which is sophisticated because it combines the sensoring system uh, in the car. You, you see the, the uh, lighting uh, both within the, the car, but also the light, the, the, um, the back lighting and the front lighting that have to censor the, the, the way you take in order to accommodate the, the lighting direction. Okay? This was quite sophisticated in their words. Uh, they had patent attached to that. Uh, but then they decided to, um, to open another branch and to just start producing lamps for the ordinary market. Uh, this was uh, uh, meant for a completely different market and so we could say that was, it was a more ordinary product. It was actually meant for a mass, pro, mass production. But that is, the reason why they decided to do that is that they needed to um, combine the uh, investments in very sophisticated products with also um, commercialization of more ordinary products in order to recover from the high investments they could, they could make on a, a separate markets. So the um, learning that they um, experienced by wor working also on other sophisticated products didn't prevent them from entering a more ordinary market. Instead, it was necessary to them to enter also that market and combine more sophisticated and more regular uh, mass, consuming, uh, mass consumer products in order to ensure sustainability, financially sustainability in what they were doing. Um, yes, so that's a very interesting paper. I will um, take a look at that. I would like to have more um, examples to make. This is the only one that I can make to uh, probably reinforce and explain also um, the results of that um, recent paper. Did Osram continue in the automobile market? Yes, they actually decided to disinvest the LED lighting uh, consumer market and they're focusing on the um, automobile market, uh, which is a mar much more concentrated market and they are focusing on also on other um, more rewarding uh, um, LED application. Thank you. This uh, concludes the first round and gives us an opportunity, as we have some time left, uh, for a second round. And it's, again, Professor Cohen, but then on his own behalf, who gets the floor uh, in, uh, first at this second round. Professor Cohen. Thank you. Again, Prorector. <coughs> um, I have a question here which is not on Chapter 5. Uh, it's a generic question and probably an unfair question um, because it asks you to defend not only your thesis, but a huge body of literature. Um, and the question is this, to what extent does main path analysis fall foul of different patenting strategies in different domains? So one of the things we've observed in the last 20 or 30 years is that firms are patenting for different reasons than they used to. Um, there was a change in the 90s where firms started patenting not as a technological a patent ceased to be a technological pr object and became a legal object or an intellectual property object, which is a different thing, um, a, or a market strategy object. And the technology took a, a back seat. And there's this famous story about Steve Jobs who, after losing what he considered to be a spurious patent case, said, okay, we've had enough, we're gonna patent everything. And so the decision to, pa to patent everything in the iPhone 5, which is when it started, had nothing to do with technology. It had to do with his view of the legal system. Now, the, one of the underlying assumptions of main path analysis is that patents are telling you about technologies. If patents are actually telling you, if people are patenting because of legal reasons or market strategy reasons to preempt other people, 
or to defend against other people. To what extent is our conclusions drawn about technological change robust? How confident can you be that what your main path is telling you is about the technology as opposed to about the market? Uh, esteem, highly esteem opponent, thank you for your um, additional question. Um, I don't know how to take it, but uh, uh, it, and so that's good because it, it's really an uh, intriguing question. Um, I've seen that, in fact, in the, in the data that we have, and I could suspect that some patenting strategy by certain firms were actually meant to um, respond to uh, strate strategies by firms of um, different kind. Um, I actually uh, didn't much, uh, um, I was not that much concerned about that in the analysis. Uh, because my assumption was that still, still if those uh, companies were uh, patenting many, many patents in a certain field, for whatever reason, still they, they own the technology, they have the experience and they are able to do that technology. So I wonder if maybe uh, it's just that you, you, you cannot really uh, trust so much on the number of patents, but in having the patents in particular fields, I think that's it's still something that would tell you about the technological um, um, position and technological uh, capabilities of a firm. I said position, and now that I said, I, I, I wonder how I could uh, account and analyze the position of a firm if I cannot count on the number of, patent, of patents and, and, the, and I couldn't really trust the quality of patents um, based on citations and based on the number of citations received. So, okay, yes, it's an intriguing question. Um, I repeat. And so if the assumption is that you just look at the type of patent that you have in the field that you have uh, without really considering the numbers of patents uh, that concentrate, that agglomerate around certain products, still you would be able to use patent as a proxy of uh, uh, technological capabilities, at, at least uh, in firms. Um, so I would stop here because this is something that would require some more uh, consideration also from my side. I hope that the um, answer is par at least partially satisfactory. Uh, if not, and if you want to rephrase it or if you want to, um, no, please, I'm happy to try again. Thank you. You did a wonderful effort um, anyway. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We will um, continue with uh, Dr. Nomala for a um, very short question, given the time that we still have left. Indeed, a very short one. So you have been working on the level of patent families. And we know that patent families, once you construct a network out of them, they tend to be cyclical. And you did a lot of cleaning to make this citation network acyclical. <laughs> And on the back of some envelope, uh, back of the envelope calculations, I see that out of the 200,000 families you have, you lost 15,000 just by the cleaning of it. Have you taken a look at what kind of babies were thrown away with the bath water? 15,000 is a lot. It's seven percent of all the families you had. Any idea what were there? Yes. What was the damage? Um, esteemed opponent, thank you for your additional question. Uh, yes, I, um, the reason why I lost so many patents on the way is that um, I started with a very large patent data set and I was very um, large in my uh, selection criteria. I had there uh, patents from any patent office and also not only patents of inventions but utility models. Those are the patent documents that I lost when I was looking at the citation network and I tried to make that acyclical. I lost especially utility models patent and there were a lot also from China, especially from China. Um, and so in a way the use of family, um, patent families as a level of analysis helped me in fact in cleaning up a little bit the data set 
and uh, um, considering only the key patents, the key uh, intellectual properties that are relevant for the technology. Um, I have concluded very rashly, but the, the point is that uh, I think um, it, uh, um, it, it there was not much damage done. Uh, I know that the other utility models, mostly uh, patents that were uh, left out, uh, were not connected mostly with each other by other um, <coughs> uh, citation links. So they were most likely more, less relevant patent document that in any way they wouldn't have much role in the uh, technological trajectory. Thank you. Emanuela Sirturi, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed and the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at Maastricht University's renowned teaching method, problem-based learning. Once the prorector reconvenes the session, we'll tune in and continue the live stream. Problem-based learning, or PBL. What does that mean exactly? Three of my fellow students and I will show you around. Every week, we analyze a different case or issue together. We discuss the case and everyone can contribute different perspectives to the group discussion. If we get stuck, our tutor helps us out and suggests what we could do next. I prefer going to the library to prepare here, I can focus and I have quick access to books or journals that help me understand the case. Today, I can also train my stitching skills in the Skills Lab, where you can immediately put into practice what you've learned. After a day like this, I like going to the gym to clear my head and get ready for the next day. At UM, you meet people from all around the world. Hello, guys. Some of them are doing their gym semester here, and they often say that PBL helps them learn and retain things very easily. I can understand why. It's a very active way of learning because you have to bring your own perspective to real life cases. You have a lot of freedom to manage your time, your studies, your hobbies and your work. Of course, that also means a lot of responsibility. Right now, for example, I'm arranging my exchange semester in Madrid. How cool is that? In this group session, we're the managers who have to allocate the resources of a real company. This is how we put into practice what we learned this morning. Studying here means being proactive and learning to plan well. Prioritizing and performing well under stress are great skills that help you develop as a person. But now, it's time to grab a coffee at the Student Service Center. Right now, we're at the Brightlands Chemlock campus. Here we can apply knowledge from lectures and tutorials in a practical setting. This helps us understand what we have learned and further develop our lab skills. Today, we're determining the amounts of cholesterol in various products. What I really like is the project periods at the end of each semester, where we complete a full research project. That includes planning, collecting data, analyzing, and presenting the findings. That way we learn how research works and we're able to see what it's like to be a real scientist. After practicals, I have to write a lab report that also helps me process everything I have learned today. UM has a lot of learning spaces where you can work on your own or with other students. This evening, I'm meeting my friends for a movie night organized by the MSP Study Association.
If you study law, you have to read quite a lot. Not all information is relevant, so you learn how to easily find the information you need to solve your case. In the afternoon, I have to give a presentation, so I like to practice it with a fellow student. Later today, a lawyer is giving a lecture. This will help us better understand the case we're working on. Speaking in front of a group is quite exciting the first time round, but you get used to it quickly. And having to present helps you also to adopt knowledge better. What I like the most is that we sometimes get to enter a plea in front of a real judge. These mood courts are really exciting. Now it's time for drinks with friends. <laughs> Studying is important, but so is relaxing once in a while.
put your leg on them. Put it on the right side. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you have to put the degree. The degree, you have to put it there. Thank you. Congratulations again. Emanuela Sirturi, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defence, and, and in view of its positive verdicts and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Verspaken is authorised to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom, and I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Dear Manuela, I think you uh, had expected that the questions were over, but there's one more that you need to answer, mm. and which is the following. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. Okay, that's the correct answer. And then, <laughs> as a result of that, uh, and by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Emanuela Sertori, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. And as evidence of that, I will now present you with the degree certificate, which is signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. I thought uh, the pro-rector would... Uh, no, the Rodatio will be done by Professor René Dalton. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Pro-rector. Dear Emanuela, dear Dr. Sitori, in a minute, or even less, um, sounds very distinguished, Dr. Sitori, and I think you really distinguish yourself uh, with this public defense and doctoral dissertation. Uh, so, uh, our con congratulations also on behalf of Bart with this uh, milestone in your professional and academic life that you reached today. So, how did this all start? Um, from our viewpoint, this started uh, when we first met at the GPAC workshop in November 2017, uh, where I was one of the Union Merit colleagues to comment on your first year presentation. Um, we had some discussions on how to, on how to further your research and your PC proposal. And what I noticed uh, that in my email, in our email conversation, we made a Skype appointment. And that sounds really like a ancient history now, but at those times there were no Zoom or uh, 
or Microsoft Teams yet. Um, so we had some discussion and you rewrote your PhD proposal and this was approved uh, in June 2018. Um, and then the PhD team was formalized uh, with uh, me and Bartas advisors. Um, and you completed then the dissertation in the next uh, four years. Um, I think for a part-time PhD uh, student combining a demanding job uh, with work on the dissertation and having to cope with COVID pandemic times and at some point also COVID yourself. Uh, I think this is an uh, excellent uh, achievement. Nevertheless, I know you would uh, have liked to have finished a bit earlier and we had some discussion on the feasibility of that. Um, but I think this only shows your strong motivation, work ethic and determination, strong determination to obtain this uh, PhD degree. And those were also the qualities that you needed uh, in these past four years. Um, because as always, work on the dissertation had its ups and downs. And you have been confronted with some important challenges uh, in the past four years. For instance, for chapter ch in chapter three, you tried uh, several approaches for the identification of technology domains. And you were struggling with cluster analysis on the basis of keywords and then clustering of individual patterns. And finally, following also Bart's advice, you finally could find a feasible method by clustering on technology classes and their co-occurrence, and that led to a, a very solid chapter. Likewise, um, for chapter five, you were initially mm -hmm. struggling with uh, how to conceptualize the entry process at the firm level. Yeah, here I was, I think, the advisor who could uh, give you some directions and you worked these out very well. Um, that also led to a very interesting chapter that attracted a lot of attention and questions uh, today. <coughs> so I think my first conclusion is that uh, yeah, the process, the advisory process also benefited from some complementary skill sets of the, of the two advisors. Um, but of course, the advisory process benefited, benefited most from uh, your qualities. And yeah, I would like to mention your commitment, your perseverance, open-mindedness, hard work, and great uh, ability to work independently. Mm. Um, maybe your independence is what, what really struck me most over the past years. For instance, after a discussion, an agreement on directions for a certain chapter, Often the next time we would meet, there would already be a full or near full draft of the chapter ready uh, without any further interaction on our sides. Um, and you would really only ask for feedback if you need it, uh, if you really needed it. But for the rest, you try to sort things out pretty much by yourself. One example is maybe the presentation today. Um, I think of the 20 PhD students who I advised and who defended their PhD successfully, uh, you're the only one who did not, before the presentation, share the slides with us to ask for some feedback uh, on, on if these slides were okay or maybe needed some amendment. So that shows your, your clear independence. No? Um, at one point, even, I think we were a bit worried about your, at least I was a bit worried about your independence. <laughs> um, so two months ago, at the end of July, we discussed uh, the final revisions to the dissertation. Uh, and then we did not hear from you for two months. Or at least I might have missed some emails, but <laughs> I don't re recall, I haven't seen any communication for two months. And then I came back from Japan only two weeks ago, and then I started to ask, okay, is everything okay with you? Uh, what's the status of the dissertation? And then you answered, well, yeah, your dissertation, of course, is already in your mailbox in you and your merit. <laughs> I was abroad, so I didn't know that. So, um, but, but what I concluded is that uh, clearly you have outgrown the need for input from your advisors today. Uh, and that is uh, how it should be, right? But, uh, on this day, for sure. So you've proven convincingly that you can perform high quality academic research independently and you fully deserve this degree today. Um, I'd like to mention one other feature of your dissertation. Um, as uh, we discussed also today, a great deal of detailed data work and comp computational effort went into uh, constructing the data sets. 
the community analysis that computers run for quite some time and downloading and processing patent and firm level data from Orbis and Podstat. Also kept servers running for days, as I understand. Mm -hmm. um, but what I then find admirable that in addition to this elaborate, elaborate quantitative work, you also conducted a substantial number of interviews with uh, lead lighting firms and experts to understand the phenomenon that you were studying much better. <coughs> and I think this shows um, yeah, the rigor of your approach and your inquisitive mindset and demonstrates that you are in no way shying away from hard work to achieve the rigor that you had in mind. Um, and this hard work, of course, paid off um, and enabled you to make a unique contribution combining community analysis to establish domains, citation analysis to establish multiple technology trajectories, and hazard analysis to establish the roles of firms' technological resources in the speed of lead lighting market entry. And like this, it has become a very coherent dissertation and a rich and varied contribution to the literature, I think. With fine-grained analysis and large-scale analysis in the domains, uh, focusing on domains, trajectories, and, uh, and firms. Actually, as also uh, the chair of the uh, committee um, suggested, it's not so common that a dissertation as a whole provides these days, no, provides more value, clearly more value than the sum of the individual chapters. Uh, but the coherence of your chapter really achieves this. At the same time, uh, of course, uh, this has not prevented you from trying to publish the individual chapters uh, in uh, international journals. So not only have you worked hard to finish the dissertation, you've also submitted your work to international peer-reviewed journals. The, the community analysis of chapter three you are currently revising for a journal. You have submitted the chapter on trajectories to an innovation journal, and we are planning to submit the chapter on entry to a management journal. So I'm quite confident that your work will find its way to a broad audience of academics and practitioners. So um, I would conclude, conclude that your doctoral degree is very well deserved uh, and that you can be really proud of this achievement. <coughs> Maybe you can be proud, even more proud, <laughs> Uh, for another reason, that you managed to write this uh, dissertation in these four years while being fully employed at the same time. Like all your fellow PhD candidates who follow the GPEC program, you combined work and dissertation, and this is much more demanding than being, I think, a full -time, uh, in a full-time PhD trajectory. On top of this, you wrote your dissertation in COVID pandemic times, which made uh, the whole process even more uh, complicated uh, and I think completing the dissertation required a lot of uh, evening and weekend work and a strong independence in research, which fortunately you had. Um, at some point you had to take some uh, a short sabbatical from your work to give your, uh, the progress of your dissertation a, a push, um, but you were fully committed and you delivered. Um, in this regard, I would also like to thank uh, your employer, uh, C. SIL in Milan uh, and your colleagues there uh, for their help and flexibility in supporting your work uh, on the dissertation over the past years. Um, I think quite a few of your colleagues might be sort of listening in on the live stream. But I think without this support and flexibility on the part of your employer, it would not have been possible to finish uh, this dissertation. I looked a bit at the, the website of, your, of the company that you're working. Um, um, and maybe it's not so surprising that your dissertation is in quite a good match with the ex fields of expertise of the company, and that is uh, industrial clusters, entrepreneurial dynamics, and economic development. Um, and I also read that your employer emphasizes reliability and intellectual integrity of its research and consultancy. And I think that you and your dissertation and your research are a perfect example of this. Throughout the process, we have, uh, I think, admired your honest and transparent and elaborate reporting uh, on the detailed data construction and analysis. And I think reliability and integrity certainly are the key words that describe our experience in advising you on this doctoral dissertation. 
I would also like to take the opportunity today to thank the members of the Evaluation Committee, Professors uh, Robin Cohen and Kenneth Simons, who unfortunately could not be here today, uh, Valentina Meliciani, who is joining on, uh, on the stream, and uh, Norman for their valuable feedback on the manuscript uh, and the constructive and helpful comments who helped to improve the dissertation even further. And Professor Simons and Under Normale also um, uh, gave feedback in earlier rounds of uh, presentations of uh, chapters of the dissertation during the GPEC sessions. Uh, thank you very much for this. Um, I'm also grateful to Nandita uh, Matthew and Fabiana Vicentin for joining and contributing to the discussion uh, today. And of course, I'd like to thank Bart for the fruitful collaboration. But most of all, of course, uh, I would like to thank you, Emanuela, for your hard work, your open-mindedness, your intellectual integrity, pleasant personality, pleasant collaboration, and for giving us the opportunity to work with you over the past years. Many congratulations again. Thank you. Dear Dr. Sertori, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you, your family and friends, your supervisors um, with the degree you have acquired. I would like to thank the members of the degree committee for their contribution. And um, before closing this session, it would be a nice opportunity to give those members of the degree committee who are online to congratulate you, uh, so they, they, let, let me give them this opportunity. Let's start with Professor Miliciano and then Dr. Matthew. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. Hi. Thank, thank all of you. Uh, uh, I'm now about to, to close this session. Um, we're available for pictures, which are mostly taken immediately afterward. And then there is a uh, uh, reception uh, anyway. I close this session.